I'm Haley from Gallifrey Public Radio, a Doctor Who fandom podcast and part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. Talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. The intellectual podcast starts now. Hello, hello. We are intellectual and we are here with tom stamager and cody frank how are you guys doing today very well and you doing very well enjoying the sunshine today very good very excited to be on the show Excellent. sorry there's a little bit of a delay i think yeah i think maybe um so now you guys have been on the show before and you know i'm sure for audience members who have listened to that they have your background but for those who haven't uh can you share a little bit about uh yourself and your production company and uh the story of how you met i think is a really good one <laughs> this, is, this is tom my name is tom stemmiger so i come from a, a long theater background and, and business background moved to the palm springs area a little over two years ago um, and did some readings for an equity theater here they decided they wanted to film one of them and just before the filming i got a call saying they were going to change one of the, the main characters, the one I interacted with the most, uh, could I please come in and, and screen with someone to, to see that? And this was a gay-themed short, and so this would be my, my male partner in, in the film. And everyone, I'm, I'm ancient, and everyone was ancient or more in, in the, the reading cast. <laughs> and so I came into the screening, and lo and behold, someone else was there. And that was me. My name's Cody Frank. Uh, I got involved in theater about four years ago and then jumped into making short films. And on the other side of that, uh, that film came into being because I had met the writer of the short and convinced him uh, he, had, he had previously only done it as a staged reading. I said, well, why don't you try to make it a film? And he said, well, okay, but um, only if you can uh, sort of direct me to some local people here. And I said, sure, but I gotta be in the movie. And then I was cast in it and that's how Tom and I met as uh, partners in this, in, this, in this film. And what was the name of that film, Cody? It was called Happy Birthday Art. And it was about this, uh, this young guy who, young guy in a uh, gay relationship who cheats on his partner with a woman, uh, his friend who is uh, celebrating her boyfriend's birthday. And throughout the, the short that comes out. That sounds like an interesting film, interesting stage play too. I can see it uh, doing well in both mediums. And it went to about a dozen uh, festivals uh, over the, the past year and now just got placed on YouTube uh, just this, this week, I think. Oh, wow. So it's, it's now out there and anybody, so if anybody sh- um, searches happy birthday art on, on YouTube, they will, they will find the place where Cody and I first met. Well, that's great. <laughs> now, okay, so you guys met and then of course you guys uh, started Pollen Path Productions. So can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, sure. So, so we met and we became friends very quickly and said, well, what, what should we do? Should we, should we do, uh, try to start a theater company? Should we try to make movies? Should we be in a play together? And we said, no, let's start a, let's start a film company. Besides we're in California and you're Hollywood, everything's about film. So let's do that. And we were struggling to come up with a name and I had read this concept in, in Navajo mythology called the pollen path that said if you were doing the things you wanted to do and your your interests and hopes and dreams were aligned with your actions then you were on the pollen path and that's where that name came from and so you guys have only had this company for about what two 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 years now give or take uh just a little over one january last year would have been the opening of so um just the last week or so we we would have been a year since we filmed uh, our first short together, which which Whitney, you were in for the love of noodles, and next month we filmed uh, next month a year ago we will have filmed our our next short. Um, so we've been open a little bit over a year, and uh, had three shorts short credit last year, and then they went to film festivals and do the things that short films do. Um, one of them also got picked up for distribution, which is great. And, and then we decided yeah, that we would, we would we would make our way or try to make our way to to feature films. So we put a request out on a screenwriter site for, for feature films around a certain set of parameters that we could do financially and, and theme-wise. 
and thought we'd get a couple of submissions. We got 85 scripts that fit our criteria. Did you read them all? Within about a month. <laughs> we did. We actually planned to hire somebody to read some of them for us. We got so many, we couldn't afford to hire the person to, to read that many. So we read them all ourselves. <laughs> and what, so obviously you guys chose one because that's why we're here today. We're talking about the feature that you're working on. Uh, what made you choose the feature that you chose? Well, that's kind of an interesting story. Uh, Tom earlier mentioned our short film Bunker. And we got a submission from a writer who actually was the writer for Bunker. And he said, you know, I, I, you guys were kind enough to produce my, my short last time. Maybe you'd look at my feature. And we never even thought that he was a horror writer as well. And so it turned out that his script was by far our favorite. And when it went out to our, our industry friends, they loved it. And so we said, oh, all right, we're on board to make this movie. Uh, and the writer's name is Travis Tapala. And we're happy to be working with him again for uh, this film. So now, was, was Bunker also a horror film? Or what would you classify that one as? I would have called it more of a, a drama. It's about a, a guy who wakes up in a underground bunker, not sure how he got there. And then as the the course of the film progresses, he learns that it's slowly running out of oxygen and he has to try to find out how to escape. So drama thriller. Yeah, that, I mean, that's kind of scary. <laughs> this could be horror. Um, yeah. So you've done a drama thriller. You did the comedy in For the Love of Noodles. And then what was the third short? The third short was the one that I made shortly before meeting Tom, which was called Nephilim, which was a proof of concept piece for a much larger uh, series, a much higher budget. What would you classify that one as? That was one of the fantasy film. Okay. So you guys have done fantasy, drama, comedy, and now you're moving on to horror. So you're, just, you're hitting everything in like a year. <laughs> right, and then we were going to do one more short that was sort of an emotional heart tugger kind of thing. So we really did have one of each. And the thought then when the shorts is that we would produce one of each. So we had a portfolio to take to investors and say, look, we can make all this kind of, kind of work. What, you know, and as we went to particular types of investors, what, what, most interest you. But then in researching film, we found in feature land that a most feature films don't actually make money. So that was a little troublesome. But of, of those that are most likely to make money, it was horror films. It's a difficult business if you want to do anything other than horror. Right. It was 37% of, of all films overall across all genres, only 37% that actually made money. Mm -hmm. But in, in horror films, it was 53 to 57%. Um, and then once you got into the subcategories within horror, some of them were more likely to make money as well, um, with one of the top ones being vampire films. Hmm. And so we, we went that direction from the fact we love horror films, for one, but also because from a pure business perspective, it was the, the best way to get into the feature film business with the best chance of success. So, okay, so your feature is called Captive, and... I wouldn't have guessed that that was a vampire film. Um, tell us more about the, the vampireness of this. Okay, well, we, uh, we don't want to spoil it because it's kind of, a, kind of a, fun, a fun twist, but the story follows a group of 20-something town stoners who are not sure what to do for the weekend. <laughs> and they're getting high in the park and think, well, what am I going to do? And, and the, sort of the leader of the group says, well, there's a house where we know that the owners go away like clockwork this time every year, and they're not back until Sunday. Why don't we break in there and have a party? So naturally, they break in, they have a party, they get high, they play some games, and then they start hearing stuff moving around in the basement. So they go down there, and they find someone chained up. And they think, uh-oh, what is this? This is getting weird. And this guy who's down there, he says, you guys got to let me out. These owners are completely crazy. So they do. And we don't really know who he is. We don't really know who owns the house. But suddenly, things start happening. And that's about all we can really say. And because it's a horror film, one can guess what starts happening. Okay. How, how far along into the process are you? Um, we're, we're just about finishing up uh, most of the, the fundraising now. We're actually going to film uh, the first two weeks of May in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Nice. A lot, uh, lot of tax credits and stuff shooting in New Mexico. 
And then sort of post Breaking Brad uh, and some of the other things that are filmed there, it also has a really large film community there, especially on, on the tech side of things to, to really be able to make high quality things. Netflix just bought a huge studio there. NBC is going to be moving in there. Fox is filming their newest television series there right now. So it, it's sort of becoming a booming area also. How did you find your location out there? Did you have a scout or somebody who suggested it? Or Well, that's kind of an interesting story. Originally, we were going to film it in a little town in southwestern New Mexico. And we were going to film there because my parents own a turn-of-the-century, early 1900s, ramshackle, run-down mansion. I don't know why they bought it, but they fell in love. And it looks like the set of basically any horror movie. It's terrifying. <laughs> it's kind of perfect. So we were, <laughs> yeah, so we were excited to film there. But as we got into the nitty gritty of logistics, um, our director said, you know what, it's going to be really hard to be five hours away from Albuquerque because all the crews coming out of Albuquerque, the equipment rentals coming out of there, and the road that takes you into this little town is scary, dangerous. So we said, you know what, let's move it to Albuquerque. It's going to be easier to do. It's going to be easier to get crew out there, get actors out there. Let's go there. Yeah, because you kind of negate some of the advantages of the tax credits and stuff if you increase your expenses by having to house everybody and stuff for the shoot, right? Exactly right. We, it was a 5% extra uh, tax incentive credit if we filmed in the smaller city. And Cody and I could stay for free and we would have the house to use for free. We would have to move 30 crew people and pay to house them and per diem them. Right. So it was easier to move Cody and I than it is 30 other people. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a wise decision. <laughs> the fun of low budget, the choices you make that, that, that become easier when you put pen to pencil and, and start to add up numbers. <laughs> well, so I'm really curious in regards to numbers. You said that you guys have been fundraising. Uh, what outlets have you guys used for fundraising? That's a, that's a really good question. Well, um, oh, go ahead. You want to you take this one, Tom? Well, so we started with ourselves and we're, we're each putting in a, a chunk and then the tax incentive puts in another chunk. So, so that's nice. Um, and then, you know, because we're a new company, we can't really go to traditional film investor sources. So you kind of have to go to family and friends and anyone who knows you and try to get in front of as many people as you can and, and see how that goes. So we've got most of the money that way. And in fact, all the money we've gotten to date is from someone that, that we know, but that sort of got us close to the end, but not to the end. Mm -hmm. Which is why our other means of raising the rest of the money is going to be a Kickstarter campaign, which is going to run March through third through April first. That's great. You can find them at film dot com. Can you say that one more time? I think you cut out just a little mm -hmm. bit, and I want to make sure that anybody who would like to donate hears exactly what that address is. Oh yeah, thank you. So to all the listeners of intellectual, the website is captivethefilm dot com, and you can follow what we're doing and we'll have fun updates and really cool perks and things you can get uh, in exchange for donating. And we'd love to have your support on this. And that's where you'll link the Kickstarter to that website as well. Correct. Right. Correct. We'll go to there right now. The website website's not there. We have a Instagram, Facebook and Twitter account that are up and running already. Um, the website will go live with, with a direct um, link over to the Kickstarter campaign when it kicks off Excellent. on March 3rd. Excellent. Um, are th is there other information that you'd like to share? I said, if you want to get super, super involved, they can even be killed as part of the, the film, as part of the Kickstarter, Kickstarter perk. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Become a victim. That's perfect. <laughs> if, they want, if they want to die on screen, this is the chance. <laughs> now, what about for um, like cast and crew? I know a lot of your crew is coming out of New Mexico, but I think we have some viewership in New Mexico, I would hope. Uh, so if, if they're interested... Uh, where can resumes be sent or are you guys using backstage? What is uh, the outlet for hiring folks? Uh, we have a casting director out of LA. Um, we are in the process right now of, of finishing our registration with SAG, who actually just last week changed the contract that the show would be made on. So we're now in the process of changing the registration with SAG so that we can be the, the signatory on, on everything. Um, and then once we have that, then the casting director can actually put out the cast breakdown on the various sites. So some backstage and Facebook pages and wherever between LA and New Mexico, 
we have room budget wise because of the incentives in order to get the incentives, you have to use New Mexico resources in order to get them. Um, but we wanted to bring a couple of people out of LA who maybe had some, some additional credits and or, or fit roles. So we have room to hire one more person out of LA. Uh, and so just whoever we see best in the, the remaining roles, there's three main roles, um, yet to, to sort of cast. Um, whoever, whatever, whoever the best person is for those three roles will bring out of LA and then the others will all have to come out of New Mexico. And then, isn't the, uh, isn't the agreement, it's like 80% of your crew has to be local New Mexico, uh, talent. It, it right? doesn't specify a percentage in ours, except that we, we don't get any tax incentive if we don't use New Mexico. Right. And then for crew, so um, if, we, if we brought them out of LA, then we're out for crew. If there, if, if, Again, we have to use uh, New Mexico resources, but the best email to reach us at through that would be info at pollenpathentertainment.com. Okay. So if there's any crew in New Mexico who's interested in working on a SAG feature film, go ahead over to info at pollenpath. Entertainment.com. Inter- oh, and they want to be background extra, yeah, background extra or have you know, like one or two lines in a cameo that we'll all cast ourselves. The, the casting director will, will fill the major roles. We, we can't announce yet, but we just got a letter shortly before we, we uh, started this, this podcast from a official horror film star screen queen who's been a, a star of several major horror films uh, who will be playing the lead in ours as well. Oh, well, that's exciting. And then we, we each um, called upon a, a friend who's, who's, who have been in the business for a very long time. So I have a friend that I've known when I started theater days in Wisconsin for uh, several decades now, who's been on Big Little Lies and Homeland and most every major TV show as a guest star in a couple of films. Um, the, she'll, be made, she'll be playing a part in the film. And then Cody has a friend as well. I have a friend who is known for his roles on uh, Melrose Plays and some other big soaps who has come to live out close to where I do and has founded an acting studio. And he has agreed to take on the project. He's got a small cameo role. So it'll be fun to, to act with him. Cool. Well, that's perfect. And so you said that he has a studio. Is his studio going to work in conglomeration with you guys as well? I didn't add in the whole, the whole thing. He's a his acting studio. So, he's, so he also uh, teaches acting. So he's, gotcha, my, gotcha. he's been my acting studio for a little while. And so he's the one who's coming on board for the, the camp. Yeah. Now, have you announced those actors on your website? Like, could you announce their names or is it still in process? Well, we can on theirs. Actually, we, we can't on, on the, the film star um, since we just got the, the letter now. So we have to go through the, the formal contract paperwork. But the, the other two who, who have agreed. Um, uh, so my friend is Sarah Sokolovic. Uh, she's the one who's been on, on Big Little Lies and, and Homeland. Um, her, she has a master's degree in acting from Yale School of Drama. Mm-hmm. She did a play on Broadway with David Schwimmer and Amy Ryan, another play on Broadway written and directed by Woody Allen. And she did a production of, of Streetcar with Joe Mangiello. So she's, she's had a very nice career and is doing wow. a huge favor by, by playing a, a fairly small part in this. Yeah, that's yeah, pretty and impressive. Then, <laughs> uh, and then, and then my acting teacher and, uh, uh, friend is Dan Godier, who was who did Kevin Buchanan on One Life to Live. Um, that's open. He was also the star of, of the film Teen Witch. But he's got a. He, and he, I think most recently he was on Criminal Minds, and he's done one or two features in the past year that should be coming out soon, which is exciting. That's very cool. It's, it's great when your friends will step up and help you out like that, right? Like lend lend uh, lend their backgrounds and their names to to help you get your films made. And then Cody, are you going to be yeah, uh, feels perf- great. are you going to be performing in this one, or are you just straight director this time around? Um, I'm going to be in this one. Uh, I was the star of Bunker, and now this will be my first this will be my first feature feature film role. Well, congratulations, pretty- man! Thank you, thank you. I'm really excited. Yeah, you had mentioned you were your director s- said something about production. Who 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 is directing? Uh, we're really excited about our director. Oh, his uh, <clears throat> his name is Alejandro Montoya Marin, and one of the reasons we're so excited about him is that he was mentored by the legendary director Robert Rodriguez mm. on a TV show that Rodriguez produced called Rebel Without a Crew. 
Very cool. Very cool. How did you go about uh, landing him to direct this? We took a trip to Albuquerque a couple of months ago now to try to line up tech resources, um, hoping we would find people there instead of having to bring everybody out of LA from tax incentive stuff. And the initial people we sent out interviews with didn't really work out, but each one of them recommended someone else who recommended someone else who recommended someone else. So we found a production manager who had been in LA for decades um, working on stuff, but recently uh, with his family moved and bought a horse ranch in Santa Fe and is wanting now to get involved in the New Mexico film world and had come across this director and really wanted to work with the director. And so we sort of got a, a two for one. We got a production manager and a director from one coffee meeting that we absolutely <laughs> adore. Well, that's awesome. It was a very value priced cup of coffee. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I think I think we were rather coffee logged by the end of that day. So I think we had multiple meetings and we never left the one building, but it was a, a very successful day. So I'm curious, um, Robert Rodriguez is pretty well known for uh, some some pretty extensive gore in some of his films. How gory is this going to be? And um, I mean, have you secured like an FX makeup person or what are you looking for in that regard? Is it going to be really bloody, I guess, is my question. <laughs> we, uh, yes, it will. Uh, we've got a <laughs> we've got a really really great makeup artist out of um, isn't she one of the few crew members crew members we're pulling from New York? Her name is Sarah Bedrick, and she uh, has done some extensive trauma and other makeup special effects for film. And regarding the level of gore, or there's going to be some pretty great pretty great scenes in there. And there's also going to be some, some implied stuff. Um, we're both fans of movies that make use of gore for not just for shock value, but when it's really appropriate to put it in. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure, yes, it's bloody, but it's also bloody at the right times and not, not over the top. Do you guys think you'll it's be going to strictly? There'll be a few survivors. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you guys going strictly with practicals? Or are you thinking of doing a little, um, like After Effects digital gore as well. We're going to be almost exclusively practical effects on this one. There's a there's a small amount in the budget if we need to clean up some stuff or add a little bit in, but largely we'll be practical. I like practicals. I feel like they're not used enough anymore, so I appreciate that. that that'll be good. Well, kind of a tangent, but I went to Disneyland recently, and which was a lot of fun, and I went on the practical rides versus the new uh, special effects rides. And I got to say, a practical holds up really, really well. And I think yeah. it will on our film, too. You haven't, you haven't ridden Rise of the Resistance yet, have you? <laughs> you know what? When I went there, it wasn't open. I did the, yeah. I did the one. Yeah, make sure you go ride that as soon as you can. David is a Disney aficionado. You might run into him, like, any given day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 the, it's the best amusement ride, amusement park ride ever built. Like it's fantastic. Wow. But it's a real interesting mix of, of like the newer technologies and like advanced traditional technologies and rides. It's, it's pretty incredible. So I feel like we have to ask this because you guys are doing a horror film. What are your favorite horror films and what's your favorite inspiration that you're bringing into this horror film from other horror films? So two for well, question. Actually, let's get more specific. What's your favorite vampire film? Oh, oh, boy, that seems like, to be the most relevant. <laughs> um, for me personally, I'm probably split between between um, Let the Right One In. Ooh, that's and a good one. I loved that movie. That was, you know, what I'm going to take that back. That was my favorite vampire movie of all time, <laughs> by far. All right, that's a good one, Tom. What about you? Well, from, from a pure horror perspective, being older, I come, I come from like the Rosemary Baby's Exorcist era. Um, and then my, my son got, got older. We, we fell in love with the whole Saw franchise, or at least the early half of the, the Saw franchise. So I, I liked initially like the, the really sort of, of spooky, scary, almost implied more than seen. But I, I apparently changed my, my viewpoint over the years. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it's uh, I think it's just the way the the horror genre in the cinema has gone. It's gone way more gore the last 15, 20 years. 
Yeah, then suspense. It's hard, it's hard to find the other type of horror film. I appreciate good suspense, though. You know, it's kind of like uh, Stephen King was saying, it's it's that unknown that's really scary. Once you open the door and it's a 10-foot cockroach, well, then you start thinking of how to, how to deal with this. But before that, you don't know how to deal with it because you don't know what it is. And that is the scariest, man. Yeah, also the paranormal I, activity and the success of those films are really because you didn't know what was happening and couldn't see it. Yeah, right. exactly. Cody, you started to say something. Sorry. Oh, I was just gonna just gonna end up to agree with you. Most of the time, by the time you see the threat, the the, the fear is over. Mm-hmm. So I agree with you that it's the ambiguity. That's why a lot of sequels aren't as good as the original because you already kind of know what the monster is. Well, so now we know what your favorite fil- horror films are. Um, is, are there any films that you're taking inspiration from in making your film? Well, Captive is unique, we think, because it's a sort of a slasher genre film that combines some romance with a lot of gore and to me, and, and even some levity and comedy to it. So I feel that tonally, it's a little similar to Scream. Okay. But some vampires. I mean, that was a really good franchise. It made a lot of money. So <laughs> I hope you are right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> it was like True Blood and, uh, and True Blood, Scream. Um, those to me are the ones that it really makes me think of. You're getting ready to head off to New Mexico to shoot. Um, but you only created your business a little over a year ago. Do you find yourselves kind of sitting back going, wow, we actually are following through on what we laid out at the beginning or you've just, or have you just always had the trust that this is where you'd be at this point? It's definitely been an, an up and down journey. We, we've taken a couple of roads and had some dealings that we thought were going to take us places that didn't. And so it's not been a straight line for sure. Um, if anything, it's, it's been a little bit faster. It's not only this film, we have four more in the pipeline right behind it. Oh, wow. Um, we're actually hoping to, to shoot a second one come this fall, but that the option agreement should be on that any day now. And we've already started talking with the director on that and, um, and working towards that one. Now, is that a feature and as well? I, I think a, it is a feature and, and also horror. Yeah. So we're, we're feature only from this point forward, unless for some reason we, we get, get, order having a hole in the schedule but um we have uh, two horrors a thriller and then sort of a social relevance film and then um last of the five currently on, on the docket is is the feature version of, of cody's original film nephilim that'll be great and that's that's the fantasy genre so, one that's that's cool exactly exactly the fantasy genre short sure. Now, you, it's kind of, it's kind, of, it's kind of shocking to us that we've that we've to me anyway that we've jumped ahead this quickly because we um, we sort of knew that we would it was always the plan but it's kind of a different thing to say yes I'm going to do this and to actually now be doing it so it's sort of a head trip really not liking your day job is wonderful motivation you talked to you guys <laughs> yeah, just exactly. a year ago and you were still in the we're going to make these shorts uh, phase you know and 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 try and prove ourselves. Um, and, and I remember Whitney and I were like, wow, you know, these guys are really ambitious. Um, it's going to be c- curious to see how successful their, their path is. Um, so it's wonderful to hear that you're, you're progressing faster than you expected even. Um, cause that's usually not the story that we hear <laughs> when we talk to people. What do you guys attribute that to just the fact that you guys have you know, support from people who, you know, are, are ready to jump in or is it just like the magic of the pollen path or some combination? Like, what do you guys think is, what's the, what's the magic recipe for you guys? Cause yeah, you guys are kind of having this media meteor like rise to, you know, one year ago opening up your company and then like doing features already. That's Awesome. <laughs> and I would say it's exactly the combo you talked about. We, we, we've joked uh, internally ourselves that if, if, if we stay mentally healthy <laughs> and, and on the same path, things sort of seem to magically open up for us. And so, so that I would call strictly the, the, the pollen path world of just really being clear on what it is that, that you want. And, and because we both have, have day jobs in some situations, we, we don't want it. It's great motivation to get off of that and onto something else to stay moving ahead even when sometimes you, you get defeated and feel like quitting, 
and we, we haven't. I, I heard I heard a, a number, and I don't know that it's remotely true, but something like ninety nine percent of all films don't get made due to funding. Yeah, and, I believe that. And we, we we particularly chose you know the the low budget, ultra low budget SAG agreement because of of the the perks that it gives to the producers to be able to offer things at a little bit lower rate. And I, I ran two small businesses before this one, and I manage a, a large business project, so I, I understand the business side of stuff. The other thing we've heard from from some industry panels is that people who've gone to film school and design school and all those things have learned great skills, but none of them are business skills. They yeah. don't know how to open and operate a business. They don't know how to manage people. They don't know how to how to do that side of it. So that's been a big advantage for us. We've been we've used the phrase the business of art from a, a friend of mine who wrote a song that had that lyric in it. That that it's been about that. That art is great, but it but it has to be a business first. If it's you so have to true. Make movies for ourselves, and no one sees them. You know, we're out of business very quickly. I know tons of artists who really could use. Uh, a, I mean, I'm be, I'm one of them. Go to a business class because there is so much business savvy that's required to be an actor, artist, a producer, a director, a music like any any of the arts fields, and you never really think about that well, until you're it, out there. And especially if you're producing a film, as you guys know, uh, every film is a startup, right? I mean, you're. You're constantly in a startup right. business mentality, and even legal entity is that it has to be its own on its own legal entity. It's not exactly. Even, you know, we're not doing it under pollen path. It's 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 its own company. So even you know knowing how to form a company and in which state and how to do it um, becomes a big deal. And then the flip side, Cody had already started in film, so I had not had any experience in film, so, but he had that. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things we talked about a year ago was that kind of synergy that the two of you bring to show business, right? Is that you, you kind of bring both, both halves of that to the equation, which I think that was one of the things that I was really curious to see how it would work out, you know, um, pairing the two of you up and seeing where you go with it. Um, I'm really excited to hear that you're, you're on the path to the feature film and to four sounds feature like you've films got with that. a bunch of them lined up behind and, you know, I, uh, yeah, I'm just to, to, to use the words of Palpatine in episode one, I'm watching your career with great interest. You're saying that. Well, so, okay. Obviously you guys have these four big things lined up. Um, and I, I'm curious to ask, like, what is, what is the dream uh, project right now, but it sounds like you already have some of those dream projects in the works. So outside of those, what's the dream after these four dreams? I'm sorry, what is the dream? What one of the dreams after, after the four dreams? I mean, we, we, one of the one of the four. So if you film four, if, if they happen to fall in the order that they're they're sort of slotted now, will be our our first original script that we're actually having written right now for us. Um, I had a theater company once and, and my, my desire when possible on that was to do something that was in current headlines and sort of got people talking where maybe talking wasn't comfortable. And so the, the fourth film is taking someone who, who we actually happen to, to know, you know, it'll dramatize his real life story, but it, it takes a story of someone who well, it was doing very well in life. The family moved to a new location and the new location didn't go well for him. He, he got bullied in school, didn't know how to deal with that and actually dropped out of school and got very, very lost in life. And in, in today's world, he went all the way to the, the far alt-right movement um, on, and, and very high up in, in that movement. But then Charlottesville happened and the violence happened and that wasn't comfortable for this person. And then they went all the way to the far left. <laughs> And sort of bounding back from that, and now it's sort of lost, and we're not sure where the, how the movie ends. We're hoping the screenwriter figures out how do we get this person back to center and have <laughs> a, a, a triumphant ending. Yeah, to say you know probably back to 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 emotionally sort of where 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 he started, but but he'll have been so moved by these other experiences he could never be back there. So where where does he go that a real person has not found yet either? But to, to take the, the, you know, the bullying campaigns and the, the political divisiveness that is in our world today and, and to put that on the screen to really show both sides, both the strengths and the weaknesses of both sides. We can't talk about that. Right, right now we have to pick a corner and, and battle as hard as we can to protect our corner. 
the, the middle is, is where we, we've lost our dialogue. Yeah. So to, to make that film for me is sort of my, my current passion project. You know, it's, it's probably three years down the road before we would, before we would make it, but it's in development right now as far as the script treatment. That's all you sound, when you talk about it, you sound very passionate. <laughs> This, this one's Tom's baby. Uh, <laughs> I, I hear about it. I hear about it daily. And I, I actually, I, you know, I never get sick of hearing about it. He's got really cool ideas and a really great writer he's working on. I think it's going to be a really neat film. That's <clears> fantastic. <throat> well, so that's Tom's baby, Cody. What, what is your baby or your, your dream project? Well, for me, really, it's the Nephilim film series. Um, the, Nephilim was the first film I ever made. And when I made it, I created this very large uh, world building behind the scenes that dealt with um, the fallout of these creatures called the Nephilim, which are, are hybrids between humans and fallen angels and them inhabiting the earth and an organization that rises to fight them. So it's a, it's a pretty in-depth fantasy action series and i've got quite a few pages of notes uh drafted on it and that's really that's really my baby if i could if i could make that movie then i think i'd be done i'd I'd say like yeah i did what i wanted to do i did what i was put on this earth to make so that would probably that'd probably be it it wouldn't really be it but at least in my mind i'd say yeah I did what I set out to do. You, you would be content with that. But yeah, it probably wouldn't be it because I'm sure knowing you guys, you'd be like, and now we have another idea. <laughs> the series, the, the, then it'd be like the sequel. There's got to be another one. <laughs> I mean, with something like that, you could totally make your own franchise. That's really the goal. Nephilim one, two, three. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and it'd be really, a, you can travel. Sequelable. That's a, if that's a word. That it is now. Lend themselves to. Yeah, it is now that lend themselves to further stories within that world. So that's probably what's going to end up taking up a lot of our time uh, after they're all done. And yeah. the short film version of that one went to a festival this year at Con uh, that is specifically for short films looking to expand into feature films. So it was selected for that festival to get its first exposure in that world, which was fantastic. And from that, a distributor picked it up in the short version and, and put it on, on a, a website um, as the short. So, it's, so it, it's got some momentum behind it already, which is amazing. Oh, man, that's great. That's awesome. Uh, what's the site where people can go and watch it? Um, they can go to occultlama.com and sign up. It's a subscription-based streaming service, just like Netflix. Mm-hmm. Uh, specifically for kind of weird films kind of that deal with magic and fantasy themes. Very cool. So that's where you go to watch it. Very, very cool. So that one's on Occult Llama. Uh, you said that uh, your... Uh, occult, bunk- occult Rama. Uh, O-C-C-U-L-T-R-A-M-A dot com. Oh, ramen. I thought you said Llama. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you said Llama as well. All right. So Occult Ramen and then Bunker is on YouTube right now. What about uh, your other films? Are there, can well, all of them be Bunker's seen somewhere? Actually, uh, no, actually, uh, Bunker's not on YouTube. It, it's currently in the film festival circuit right now, so we can't, we can't release it yet. Gotcha, fact, that one. Yeah, so this, uh, let's see, what is today's date? Um, it's going to be playing at the Glomans Chinese Theater. Ooh, that's festival, awesome. Which is going to be on February 26th. Second, at uh, the Golden State Festival, and then shortly afterward, it'll be at Pensacon Film Festival in Florida. Very cool. So you can go to our do that. I, I give you the dates right now, but I don't. Uh, I don't have it in my head. Okay, and it's a Happy Birthday film that's on YouTube. Happy Birthday films on YouTube, right? Excellent. And for oh, for the love of noodles, where can people see that? Is that still circling around film festivals, or where's that hanging out? That has finished its, its film festival time, and so it is hanging out on our computer at the moment. Um, we actually need to probably publish that on YouTube, on YouTube, but we've not. So that would be a good project for us to take on, so it can be there. All right. So now everybody knows where to get those. What else are you guys up to? <laughs> as if you don't have enough that you're juggling, right? You know, we, we've learned quickly as, as film producers what we really are, full-time fundraisers. Um, yeah. So, so well, while, while, That while, is while, what producing while, is. <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, well, Bunker is just about, or sorry, Bunker. Well, Captive is just about there now, and the Kickstarter will hopefully take that over its stuff. Now we're starting the fundraising for the one in the fall. Um, so that'll be at, at four times the budget of this one. Oh, so wow. It will need uh, some additional help. But we, we actually we about halfway raised on that already. So we're, we're halfway home to a million, but have the other half yet to go that we haven't really even started in on yet. So that's our next. That's and so when it comes like to what's on our plate, it's like, and what hobbies or anything else, it's really, let's see, it's 1130 at night. I think I should check my email again. It's <laughs> basically what we're doing them too. You guys even have hobbies outside of this? I mean, you're like going to film festivals, you're fundraising, you're doing all the pre-production. I, I play tennis, but I have to be done by eight in the morning so I can be home and showered and ready to work. <laughs> wow. Well, okay. Here's, the gym in the morning, that's about it. Here's a question because this goes back to the whole artist being business people as well. How strict of a schedule do you guys keep to in regards to your film production? Is it nine to five or what, what do you guys do? What's um, your 10 to six, day? Yeah. yeah. Monday, Monday to Friday, 10 to six. Um, if something life-wise comes up, um, certainly we, we give ourselves a break, but we try to do that. And, um, and we both have a bit of day job work to do yet. So Cody also goes somewhere else to work on Saturdays and I go when called upon to, to be elsewhere as well. So we try five days a week, 10 to six as much as humanly possible. Well, it sounds like you guys are on the path to not having the day jobs by the end of the year. (laughs) year Well, I'm, uh, I'm just in awe of, uh, of how fast you guys are moving forward on things and, uh, super impressed at, uh, at how you guys are pulling things together. And, uh, I look forward to having you guys back on the show again in the future to continue following the path that you're on that pollen path that you're on and, 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 and how it's turning out. That would be great. See how it's going. Well, thank you guys so much thank for coming you. on and talking with us. And, um, yeah, I mean, keep on keeping on. You guys are getting at it. So that's awesome. Thank you so much for having us back again. It was great. Yeah. Next yeah, time we'll do it in person good. again. <laughs> that would be even better. <laughs> so, all right, guys, uh, any, any last place you want to try and direct people before we sign out? The easy one is go to captivethefilm.com, which will redirect to our Kickstarter. March 3rd through April 1st, if you want to help us succeed in building this dream of ours. All right, guys. Thank you again for coming on. Whitney, thank you for coordinating and getting this all together. No problem. And uh, until next time, um, best of luck on, on the films, guys. We look forward to seeing how they all turn out. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Hello there, citizens. I am the terror that flaps in the night. I am the floaty that will not flush no matter how many times you try in the toilet bowl of crime. I am Darkwing Duck, telling you please talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. <laughs> Whatever the heck that means. After all, you are watching Intellectual Podcast with your ears. Intellectual Podcast.